efforts. Following the Industrial Revolution, labor has continued to be a dominant force in shaping both, U both U.S. society and visual culture. Today, the American dream remains elusive for many. In our examination of these works, we were attentive to artistic, artistic intentions, sitter experiences, political views, and aesthetic approaches to better understand the impact of visual culture for the American worker. Despite our efforts, we were unable to determine a collective definition of the working class. We recognize that our personal experiences heavily influence how we engage with the works. We challenge you, as you hear more about these works, to think of your own understanding of what the American worker is. How has visual culture contributed to your interpretation? Our, collect our collection of works span from the end of the Industrial Revolution to the modern day. The main image of the American worker was primarily cultivated in the Great, Great Depression through photographs, prints, and paintings. These works address the depiction of labor through the lens of anonymity and individuality. The, artistic, the artist's personal relationship with the subject is questioned as to investigate how personal motivations and firsthand knowledge, as well as lack thereof, influence the nuance of the type of work and how the workers are being depicted. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Morgan. Hey everybody, my name is Morgan Beam. I'm an art history major from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, okay, so we chose to begin our exhibition with William Gropper's reconstruction because it depicts a multitude of laborers at work. In fact, every individual in the composition is, complete, is completing a task. Visually, these workers are united by their white shirts, making them appear even more numerable. It is a vivid scene of construction, action, and productivity. Also, reconstruction is an excellent example of how an artist can use an image of labor to express their own political values. William Gropper's relationship with American labor under capitalism was tumultuous, even from an early age. His parents, Jewish immigrants from Romania and Ukraine, were low-paid employees of the garment industry, despite Mr. Gropper's university degree and fluency in eight languages. Gropper and his family were living in poverty on the Lower East Side when, in 1911, his aunt died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire due to poor working conditions. This tragedy was the largest industrial disaster New York City had ever seen. Undoubtedly, Gropper gained a distrust of capitalism in his formative years. As a young artist, Gropper studied under George Bellows and Robert Henri, both Ashcan painters who employed a realism in their depictions of New York City life. Reconstruction reflects a color palette of gritty, dirty, neutral colors, which may reflect some of his Ashcan influence. Gropper worked as a political cartoonist for newspapers including the New York Tribune and the Liberator, where he openly expressed his socialistic and communistic ideas. Clearly in this imagery, Gropper's communistic ideals about the unity and productiveness of labor are apparent. The productiveness and hopeful possibility of the image is manifested in its unfinished painterly quality, such as in the paint cans visible in the foreground. Painted during his visit to Poland for a communist convention, the city of Warsaw, post-World War II, depicted here is in a state of literal reconstruction, and the workers must band together to create a new city and a new way of life. However, as the laborers are unified, they are simultaneously anonymized. They possess very little in the way of individualization, even the figures in the foreground. It must be considered that this was a deliberate choice on Gropper's part, especially when noting his familiarity with individualized figures by means of caricatures in his political cartoons. The question raised by the treatment of laborers in Reconstruction is, are the workers perceived as harmonious, productive union, or have their, has their labor erased their individuality? This question, prompted by the opening piece of our exhibition, is a continuous theme of division of labor, evidence in the following works. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jordan. Um, so anybody who's standing in the back, y'all can feel free to have a seat. And also, 
Um, so my name's Jordan. I'm an art history major, and I'm from Hartsville, Alabama. And like Reconstruction, the last photo we looked at, um, Ombre, right here, was created by an American artist outside the United States. Pablo Higgins was born in Salt Lake City, Utah in 1904, trained at the Academy of Arts in San Diego, and later in Chimpingo, Mexico in 1924. There he obtained citizenship and joined the Mexican Communist Party. He was a member of a politically motivated guild of Mexican artists and trained and painted murals with Diego Rivera. In his independently produced works, O'Higgins created paintings, sketches, murals, um, and other things that suggest strong solidarity with workers, particularly farmers. He referred to farmers as the producers of everything and drew attention to the poor working conditions in which they worked in hopes of inciting political change. Ombre by Pablo O'Higgins is a lithographic print that focuses on giving the Mexican farmer portrayed a sense of identity and agency. Lithography is a printing process in which images are drawn with a greasy substance onto a flat stone or metal plate. Ink is then applied to this plate, and the ink sticks to the grease and is repelled by the rest of the surface. Paper is then placed against the surface, and the plate runs through a press. In this lithograph, O'Higgins uses bold and energetic line work to create the portrait, perhaps implying that his sitter holds these same characteristics. But the man's face appears weary and serious, which contrasts with the loose style of the sketch. The sitter's relaxed, forward-facing pose and open expression contribute to the idea that this man has an identity beyond his occupation. He is further humanized by the fact that his face is drawn approximately the same size as real life. Obviously not here, but in the exhibition. And so, our exhibition focuses on depictions of labor or laborers that either anonymize or individualize workers. Ombre does both. O'Higgins is giving this farmer and Mexican farmers as a whole a face and an identity, but the work still presents a sense of anonymity and ambiguity. No information is provided regarding the man's actual identity, and it is unknown whether or not the artist knew this farmer personally. His ambiguous identity suggests that he could be any worker, thus making him a stand-in for any and all marginalized Mexican farmers. In our research for this exhibition, we discovered that many depictions of labor and laborers depict workers as other. This is something done through a or this is sometimes done through a voyeuristic lens, and other times is done in order to draw attention and incite change. O'Higgins, while expressively portraying his sitter's identity, also intentionally others him in order to draw attention to his poor working conditions. This greatly detailed portrait of a farmer staring the viewer solemnly in the face is not in any way voyeuristic. The farmer's haggard, ordinary appearance, emphasized by expressively depicted wrinkles and lines, draws attention to itself, though. This emphasis on the man's haggardness implies that he has undergone hardships and thus others him and helps to convey O'Higgins' political message that farmers needed improved working conditions. The portrait of a Mexican farmer, Ombre, simultaneously gives its subject an identity and portrays him as a worn and wearied everyman in order to incite political change. And next we'll have Katie. Hi, I'm Katie Good, and I'm a studio art major. Um, I'm from Huntsville, Alabama. So this next painting is uh, by Gregorio Prestepino. Um, he was born on the Lower East Side of New York in 1907, and is known for being a social realist who devoted most of his career to depicting the scenes of the working class that draws awareness to the harsh realities for these city dwellers. Um, so most realists are, were dissatisfied with um, the American societal structure that isolates them from becoming a part of the greater society. And so they use their art as a weapon to fight against this biased social power structure. So this is one of his earlier works called Donkey Engine. Um, it's, a, it's highly stylized, almost abstracted scene of a steam engine carrying a worker in the New York shipping yard. So here Presapino wants to draw attention to the divisions of class that is set within this social, uh, social power structure and the harsh conditions that are maintained within them. So he focuses the scene on the shipping yards and workers of the Lower East Side New York and it emphasizes the importance of the daily physical labor of the working class and being vital to the day-to-day -day functions of the city, yet are hidden and overshadowed by the upscale urban city within, urban life within the city. 
So Presepino is exceptionally successful in his attempt at this political creek for the way he is able to transport the into the scene, allowing us to almost experience what is happening. You can almost feel the bitter cold through the cool tones, the snow-coated ground, and the bundled up figures at the bottom right. Through this rough, gritty style and stocky, intense brush strokes, Prestopino is able to communicate these sounds and smells and feelings that would have been experienced by the workers at this instance. And then we can also see the worker on the side of the engine. Um, he's assuming an activated swinging pose off the engine onto the ground, transitioning from one task to another to emphasize this daily backbreaking toll of these dock workers. And also by de-emphasizing um, all the special or distinctive facial features, Prestopino uses these figures as a stand-in for the working class as a whole. However, like his, his de-emphasis of indivis, individualization always raise, also raises questions about the an anonymity of the working class that is placed by the societal structure. Um, as we've talked about earlier, it almost implies that there is only one collective purpose and that the individual must conform to it. By emphasizing that exaggerated size and sense of movement of the engine, the worker in the painting seems even more anonymous. This tension calls into question not only the anonymity of the worker, but the role of technology and labor, an issue, an issue with which American economy and culture still struggle. So now I'm going to turn it over to Madison. Hi, I'm Madison Langman, and I'm a finance major with an art history minor. So this image is a lithograph and it's Mervyn Jules' watch repair. Known for his use of art as social commentary, Mervyn Jules is known as an artist with a genuine social conscience and also as a spokesman for liberal ideas. More specifically, Jules expressed his artistic interest and excitement about people and what they do. Watch repair exemplifies this idea and its focus on a man immersed in the work in front of him. Against a dark background and seated at a kitchen table, the jeweler is illuminated by dramatic light from the lamp above, making him the focal point of the composition. The artist places the viewer above the man, as though standing next to the table or as an outsider looking in on this late night potential hobby. This viewpoint reveals the entire workspace with different timepieces, from pocket watches hanging in the back, a clock resting on the table, and the minute detailed work in the jeweler's hands. Watch repair is made through the method of lithography, a type of printmaking using stones. In this method, the artist draws the image directly on the stone with litho crayons or other pencils made of wax or grease mixture. Once drawn, the stone is treated with a mixture of acid and gum arabic to bond the materials to the stone's surface. The spaces left free of wax or grease are then affected by the gum arabic, which then in turn attracts water. Therefore, when the artist wets the stone, the areas hold water, allowing for oil-based ink to be applied and sticking only to the original drawing. To finish, the ink is transferred to a paper page, producing the final print. Producing this image through lithography adds a lot of texture and depth to the image. The rubbing of the surface of the stone enables surfaces such as the table to have more grit and lifelike lines, adding dimension to already present grain of the furniture. This increased amount and complexity of texture is also visible in the hair of the man, creating subtle but important lines that help bring movement and depth, adding lifelike qualities. The variety of shadows are also enhanced by the added texture of the method, making some appear darker than others and creating contrasting shading across the wall behind the man. The setting appears to be some type of residence due to the back of the chair, which has etchings of different fruits and swirled motifs, traditionally designs displayed in kitchen areas. The location is made to feel intimate, a privileged view into the home of the jeweler, partaking in this supposed late night hobby. The shadows created from the contrast of the dim lamplight and dark backdrop emphasize the parameters of this small space. These shadows also create depth in the shallow room, especially through the shadow of the chair reflected on the back wall, extending the space. The viewpoint is one from above, enabling one to peer into the home and obtain an inside view of this intimate space of the laborer and his specific workspace. This intimate home setting differs from other laborers and surroundings in our exhibition. Instead of a well-populated factory, this is an individual solitary workspace, presumably residential. The contrast between the two places plays a part in understanding the differences in meaning. 
Where the other representations of labor in our exhibit show a group of laborers in a more formalized work setting, Jules' image depicts a more relaxed at leisure style of work, leading us to interpret this as a hobby versus a day job. Due to it being a hobby, it becomes a more individualizing type of labor and depiction of the man. Compared to the work reconstruction, which has the effect of anonymizing the laborers in the image, watch repair does just the opposite. The type of work, repairing a watch, is a specialized type of labor, molding the man's image and individualizing him as a laborer. The location of the laborer in a solitary personal setting only adds to this effect of individualization. Mervyn Jules, recognized for his skill and interest in depicting individuals and what they do, achieves this in watch repair. And now I'm going to hand it over to Chandler. Hello, my name is Chandler West. I'm majoring in both history and English literature and minoring in art history, and I'm from Coleman, Alabama. Uh, this semester I worked with Lewis Hines, Opelika, Alabama, 1914. Um, 19, Opelika, Alabama, 1914 depicts two separate groups of children headed into work at a local mill. Hines' photography style emphasizes anonymity by depicting the workers from behind, obscuring their faces. In the photo, Hines Hine seems to mani manipulate the light cast onto the building to create a separation between the two groups of children. The group of children on the left side, uh, on the left hand side of the photo, seem to mostly be older and closer to an appropriate working age based on their stature, but Hines focused on the, younger two on the younger two children on the right side in his caption. Hines' caption claims that the family re family's records, the father and the boy's appearance, all disagree on how old the youngest boy in the photograph is, with Hines saying that he couldn't be any older than nine. Hine also mentions that the boss at the mill saw an investigator taking photos of the boy and told the investigator to stop. Hine's caption shows that he sought a personal connection with his subjects and a desire to eliminate the industry of child labor. Originally a teacher, Hine quit his job to travel the country and take photographs of the National Child Labor Committee, or NCLC. Hine's time photographing the American worker began during his time at the Ethical Cultural School in New York. Hine often sought to explore the relationship between the worker and their workplace, as he saw manual labor as an honorable occupation to make ends meet. Strongly supporting the mission of the organization, Hine was inspired by the work of the NCLC. Okay, next one. Um, here, I, here I bring in Hine's breaker boys employed by the Pennsylvania Coal Company. The way Hine has depicted the four boys in the photo, wearing tattered clothing and clearly exhausted from a full day at the mine, while still maintaining a childlike innocence, shows Hines' passion for advocating against child labor and his large contributions to ensuring its end in America. Now I will turn it over to Madeline. Hi, I'm Michelle, and today I'll be discussing this work by Andrew Wyeth. It's called Studio Window, Portrait of Willard Snowden. It's painted in 1967. We chose this work to be included in our exhibition for several reasons. Like some of the works we've discussed, this is an individualized portrait of a laborer, which contrasts with the works in the exhibition that are more anonymizing. Furthermore, there is a nuanced history between the artist of this work and the subject, which allows us to draw conclusions about the effects of labor on Wyeth's body of work. Finally, we wanted our exhibition to be diverse in terms of who makes up the laboring body, to be an accurate representation, which includes diversity and race. As the story goes, Willard Snowden was a retired merchant seaman who came to Wyeth's home one night and knocked on his door looking for work. Wyeth was said to have been electrified by the sight of him and immediately took a liking to him. He allowed Snowden to move on to the abandoned schoolhouse on his property that he used as a studio. Wyeth saw Snowden as an elegantly speaking drifter passing through like a modern wise man, cloaked in mystery. Elements of this can be seen in the many portraits Wyeth did of Snowden, including this one. Snowden represents labor in the context of our exhibition because of his past as a merchant marine and in the context of working as Wyeth's studio assistant throughout the time he appeared in Wyeth's paintings. It is clear just from looking at the study that Wyeth paid particular attention to how he depicted Snowden. His use of color renders a stream of light coming down from an unseen window that casts Snowden in light when he is otherwise concealed in shadows. This can be interpreted as a visual representation of the air of mystery Snowden had about him. Wyeth had a visual interest in the architectural features of Snowden's hands and clothing, which he articulates in graphite. Wyeth believed individuals of color, specifically African Americans, were missing in painting during the time he was actively producing art, and says it is because they are the most subtle people to understand. Indeed, Wyeth was a prolific artist, at one point having over 70 works of art that depicted over a dozen black models. 
Wyeth's upbringing may explain his interest in these individuals. Wyeth grew up in a township in Pennsylvania near a largely black community known as Little Africa, where he spent much of his childhood, and many of his subjects were also from this area. It is important to note that Wyeth's statement of African Americans can be seen in a way that others them, and that Wyeth depicted, but that Wyeth depicted his black subjects in the same way that he depicted his white subjects, often alone and in their place of residence, looking solemn or serious, with close attention paid to the details of the face. As a curator of his works once said, there is a sentimentality of his portraits and an affection. Snowden himself was cognizant of this and praised Wyeth for depicting his black subjects in a way that art other artists of his time did not. Snowden once said that so many people, they get the idea of some silly bunch of jokes, damn foolishness. Mr. Wyeth sees what I can see, that thing that's distinct, very distinct. He's painting a real life person. So thank you, and I'll pass it on to Madeline. Hello, everybody. I am Madeline Seidel. I am an art history major from Birmingham, Alabama. And tonight, I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite pieces in the exhibit, Walker Evans' Untitled, Lucille Burroughs Picking Cotton. It was created in 1935 to 1936. And it is a, I believe, gelatin photograph. But yes. Walker Evans is one of the most well-known photographers hired by the Farm Security Administration to document farm labor during the Great Depression. His photographs of workers brought a face to the plight of rural America during the most infamous period of economic collapse. Lucille Burroughs, a 10-year-old girl pictured here, was the daughter of, poor, of a poor sharecropper family in Hale County, Alabama. She and her family picked cotton in order to support themselves in the face of dire financial struggles, and Evans documented this family's daily life. Burroughs is photographed while undertaking this grueling task, and Evans makes several aesthetic choices that make Burroughs an anonymous figure. She is covered in clothing with a wide-brimmed hat. Her back is to the camera, making her face completely obscured. The contrast of the photograph is extremely low, and the various shades of gray make it hard to differentiate where Burroughs' body ends and where the field begins. Additionally, the high angle and the tight framing of the composition only include Burroughs' figure and the field itself. This gives the subject no geographical context in which to ground themselves. As viewers, we only know that this photo features, features Lucille Burroughs and that it takes place in Hale County because the title tells us, not because the photograph itself conveys it. Evans captures Burroughs' struggle, but the photograph is voyeuristic and impersonal because her face and identity is hidden from the viewer. Burroughs' visual anonymity makes her a stand-in for all the other young girls forced to work alongside their families through widespread economic crisis. This anonymity creates a strange contrast in Evans' photograph. Burroughs is the personalized by the fact that she is the sole focus of the shot and the only human figure in it. And yet, we know very little about her identity. Evans is focusing on the plight of Burroughs instead of Burroughs herself. This, dehumanizing and other, this is dehumanizing and othering because Burroughs is solely defined by the work she does. She is portrayed so that she lacks all personal identity outside of picking cotton. As the photographer, Evans has all of the control in the composition of the shot, further denying the subject agency in crafting her own story. Additionally, the high photo angle seen here strengthens this hierarchy since sh higher shots typically indicate that the subject is in a position of lesser power. Like in all photography, untitled is a construction of the narrative burnt up Evans intends to portray. He makes the creative choices to make her a blank slate in every man at the expense of Burroughs herself. Evans' photograph creates a relatable image, but in the process, he takes away individuality and agency. And now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Catherine. Hello, I'm Catherine Ackerman. I'm a studio art major from Monroeville, Alabama. I had the pleasure of working with John Augustus Walker's Rainy Day at the Mill. A little background about Walker himself. Walker was from Mobile, Alabama. A lot of his work was inspired by the Gulf Coast and trips to Cuba and Key West. This sense of, stop, or sense of travel is evident in his color palette of strong colors. Some of the themes and subject matter he focused on range from Mardi Gras, fantasy, historical themes, to landscapes and portraiture. 
One of the products Walker is most distinguished for is, his, is the Historical Panorama of Alabama, which was funded by the Works Progress Administration and commissioned by the Alabama Extension Service for ex exhibit at the 1939 Alabama State Fair. All that to say, it is easy to say his see his ties to the, his home state of Alabama. With Rainy Day at the Mill, we see the byproduct of industrial labor alluding to industrial stream, steam in the background, contrasting with the men performing physical labor in the foreground. This juxtaposition raises the questions, are humans necessary or will they be replaced by technological and industrial progress? As seen in other works in our exhibition, the figures do not have any defining facial features, which makes the workers seem anonymous and indistinguishable from one another. As stand-ins for the hardworking man, everyman, this portrayal might be seen to glorify the group as a whole. Visually speaking, the overall composition has a quality of elegance. The men in the foreground appear as if they are dancing. While it's visible they are trying to keep their balance, they still remain composed. The colors play a role in the overall composition, adding to the mood of the rainy day. The steam is again playing off the sense of elegance as it seems to float out of the border. Much of the composition seems directional, such as logs floating out of the composition, as well as the rain falling in another. The men appear to be unfazed by the rain itself as they continue to work. There are gestures being made to suggest the hard work of the men. The rain itself acts as a symbol of diligent and sweat of these men. There is also a push and pull between nature versus industry. We see the majority of the background is that of industry style work, but there is a sense of nature still remaining which indicates the growth of industry and what it has become. I will now pass it on to Chioma. Thank you. Hi everybody, um, my name is Chio Mahal. I am a art history major from Tampa, Florida. I will be the last of the curators to speak with you guys tonight. And I will be discussing um, decks photographed by Chad States. Chad States masculinity, masculinity Series focuses on the inclusion of individuals who self-identify as masculine, regardless of gender identity, sexual orientation, or cultural background. The series examines how personal development of masculinity differs from socially structured manhood. Dex is a radical representation of a person laboring who does not fit the typical heteronormative narrative of work in America. Here, the representation of labor arises through the depiction of a transgender male in the process of remodeling his home. We view Dex as he is taking a break from work as he sits at the bottom of his staircase. He rests at the center of the composition, covered in dust, with his legs spread apart as an expression of his masculinity. Dex appears to be as slightly uneasy in this incomplete space. All active components have come to a stop for a single moment for states to take this photo. There is anticipation for the work necessary to be completed. As Dex is surrounded by demolition tools and fragmented materials, the setting embodies the concept of self-construction and renovation. Chad States created his masculinity series to create real, tangible accounts of men and their thoughts on masculinity to better understand the complexities of manhood in America. Individuals personify their own definition of masculinity through the sitting, a dynamic that gives the individual power to control their presentation while contributing to state's exploration of identities. Every element of the composition is all the more intentional. To conclude, on behalf of my amazing group and the museum, I would like to thank everyone for attending this event. We hope that as you walk around our exhibition, you engage with the works with a new understanding of how laboring workers have been perceived. These images not only appreciate the efforts the efforts of laboring workers, they bring back the humanity to a group often imposed with misconceptions and stereotypes. Thank you.